Act 1. Fade in. Just sunset. Southwestern United States. Scrubby desert wilderness. Sunlit mountains are seen in the hazy distance. The light blue sky is filled with contrails. They are numerous. They create a crisscrossing patchwork of long white clouds. Some contrails are straight, dense, and newly laid. Most are wispy, wind-blown smears covering the entire sky. A target is approaching. On course to fly right over. Roger that. Green Station? Yes, Captain. Time to intercept. One minute. I see the target. Laser sighting. Now. Got him. Station One. Do you read me? On a low hilltop stands a man. As we zoom in closer, we see he wears a camouflage military field uniform matching the desert colors. The uniform has no insignia. He is a white man about 40 years old, sweating, very pale, and red-eyed. At his mouth is a wraparound microphone attached to an earpiece. He scans the sky with binoculars. Station 1, standing by. Prepare to launch. Right. The man on the hill pulls off camouflage netting to reveal a large, white surface-to-air missile. He powers up the missile by pressing keys on a computer in the weapons platform. The rocket's nose rises to the sky. Sir, it has acquired the target. We gonna open a can of whoop-ass, Captain? Red. Time to intercept. Green station? Thirty seconds. Sir, I got three riders closing on station one, from the west. Identify. We see three riders on horseback from Station One's point of view. Riding three abreast, the sun sets behind them and throws long shadows across the desert floor. Target now within range. We see the jet flying high above them. A long white contrail extends far behind it. Station One, riders almost on you. Stand down. Stand down. Station One hits keys on the computer keyboard. The missile freezes and shuts down. We've powered down, Captain. It's the Bureau Ranger. Jesus H. Christmas. With one's parents. Station One. One. Do you copy? We lost the tanker. Did you tell them about this? One? No. We're losing daylight. We'll have to wait for sunrise. That's nuts. This whole place will be crawling with hostiles. How we get out of here? We don't. Sir, Ranger has weapons. Gung-ho. We hear the metallic clicks of firearms locking and loading. Men, show respect. We got a real hero there. Army combat. Two tours. Purple hearts shot to pieces. Hostile? What do I know? Safety's off. Fire only on my command. The scrubby desert hilltop, vivid in the light of the setting sun. The man stands beside the white missile, which is still aimed toward the sky. He doubles over in pain. Then he falls to his knees, clutching his stomach. One, what is your status? One falls on his side. He draws his knees to his stomach. It's okay. I'm okay. We hear horse hooves approaching him. Then we see the shadows of horses and riders thrown on the white missile and the stricken man. You got nerve for this? The man barely looks up. Finally. The ranger is American Indian. She is short, muscular, and dressed in the green uniform of a U.S. Forest Service ranger. She's hard-looking, but very handsome. The man on the ground before her will now be identified as the son. How? I've been on to you for days. With the ranger is Da, age 60. He's a tall, thin, weathered white man. He wears casual white linen pants and shirt. He dismounts. The other rider with him is Ma, age 60, a white woman. She's beautiful but severe and now very worried. The holster on her waist holds a revolver. She takes off her cowboy hat. Using it as a sunscreen, she looks around from her saddle. Son, can you put me on speakerphone? Have your folks hear me loud and clear. With difficulty, the son pulls his walkie-talkie off his waist. He sets on the speakerphone function. He pulls off his earpiece. Ready. People, you have entered a restricted area. Da kneels beside the sun. Da? This is not the way. Not this. The sun struggles to speak. No more books. Now hear me. Leave. At once. Ma still scans the countryside. 
Somewhere nearby, hidden in camouflage foxholes, are the militia lookouts, who now have their eyes and weapons trained on the intruders. Wherever you are, I, I think I know you. I'm not leaving without my son. Her son shakes in pain. He can't help you now. She dismounts. If you leave right now, you're free to go. She looks at her son. Bad timing, huh? The son is curled in a ball, but manages to nod. Da, a fire, please. Daughter, we'll need some wood. The ranger limps over and kneels beside the son. Either you convince me why you have to do this, and I will help you, or I will stop you. The sunset is glorious, but very fast. A wood fire is started. Darkness encloses the hilltop campsite. Fade out. Fade in. Night. The hilltop campfire. The sun is still curled in a ball. Where's your medicine? The sun removes a small bottle from his shirt pocket. He drops it. Ma picks it up and reads the label. Where's your medicine? That's all. He hands the bottle to Da. That works. After a moment reading the label, Da shakes out some pills from the bottle. He opens a canteen. He gives the pills to his son. His son takes the pills and drinks. We'll do what we've always done. Let's make a poultice and some hot rocks, lots of water. One, if you want, leave with your folks. Get out of here. Captain, by morning, I'll function. Another voice now speaks on the walkie-talkie. The ranger instantly recognizes it. What harms you, son? Crohn's disease. Ma takes a towel from the kettle of water set over the fire. It makes his intestines knot up. The ranger scrapes small stones out of the flames of the campfire. What causes this? No one knows the cause. Or how to cure it. The women wrap the hot rocks in the wet towel. They uncover the son's stomach and place the poultice on his belly. Why this? Chemtrails. They are contrails. Da sits before the fire. They are chemical trails. They've been spraying since the mid-1990s all over the world. Their condensation from the moisture in the atmosphere. Contrails dissipate in minutes. These last all day. What do you begin here, Captain? Da, you know for ten years we've been talking about chemtrails with local, state, and federal people. To the EPA, FAA, Air Force. To anybody who'd listen. For ten years, they've stonewalled us. Total denial. Look, we've continuously provided chemical samples from the trails, photographs, scientific studies, testimonies on the bioassays of the spray. Ten years. If anyone ever responds, they say they're unaware of anything other than contrails. Ten years. If they are chemical trails, why? There are many stories. It's to slow down global warming. Hopefully. The aluminum oxide in the spray reflects sunshine back from the Earth. There are too many elements in what they spray for that alone to be plausible. Who's doing it? The feds. I don't believe they do it, if they are chemicals, without telling us. Or asking for our consent. You, you can't medicate people without their informed consent. Captain, there is a medical treatment. We can deal with most of the chemicals they spray at this time. How? We can protect ourselves from the misuse of a very sophisticated technology. This misuse seems to be an assault on our sovereignty. That I understand. It's biological warfare. It's some sort of population control. They're spreading viruses and bacteria to genetically modify us. It is a treatment. For what? My theory? Primarily, it's to affect our minds. How do you know? Mental effects of chemtrails are completely underestimated. The scalar wave technology of HARP and the electronic frequencies emitted by radios, TVs, computers, cell phones, all work with the trails to affect our minds. Why? It makes us more susceptible to the distortions of reality we're going to be exposed to. This process has been going on for some time. But now there's more sophisticated technology they're spraying on us. 
What you are planning here is a fatal mistake. It's terrorism. Some will call this treason, but it's survival. This is really about protecting our spirits. Somewhere in the darkness, a coyote howls. It's about protecting our land base. Civilization is going to crash. It's going to be messy. The sooner it crashes, the better. More life remains to, to support survivors. You're a writer. We're all writers. Words can... Words are not weapons. This will bring much more violence. How can you think otherwise? Uh, it's the aluminum oxide leaching into the soil. It toxifies all the land. It gets into food, water, our bodies. Native plants won't grow. Every day they lay down millions more tons of it. Monsanto's taken out patents on GMO seeds that grow in aluminum-saturated soil. Why? They know. They know what most people refuse to see with their own eyes. All right. Suppose they are spraying chemicals. Isn't that illegal? It's been decided in court that so-called weather modification through cloud seeding is not breaking any law. It's chemical trespass, da. That's the law they break. People, you better leave now. Leave your mounts, your weapons, walk out. By the time you get away, we'll have done what we came here to do. The ranger just looks towards her assault rifle. Red laser lights from the militia lookout's telescopic sights flutter on her chest. Ranger, stand down or be taken down. Ma, Da, if you're here when we launch, you will get caught. They can arrest you without probable cause. They can jail you without charges and hold you indefinitely without trial. They can even torture you, legally. Since when? Habeas corpus was suspended after 9-11 with the Patriot Act. Look, since the Defense Authorization Act passed Congress, anyone, anywhere, including Americans in their own homeland, can be arrested by the military and held indefinitely. If they torture you, it's legal. Most likely, caught in a sweep after the launch, we'll be held as enemy combatants and disappear into the military prison system. No legal representation. No charges need ever be filed against us. If they take us alive. You can just vanish. Forever. They are right, Da. For a moment, Da ruffles. Then he slips back into his state of calm. Doctor, you've been missing out on a lot. He's been hiding out too long at his fancy hell spa. Come on, let's go. No one moves. Ma draws the horses over. Da, come on. I said... Walk out. The red dots swarm over Ma's chest. Shoot me? We've known each other forever. If we have to. But it probably won't be one of us that tags you if you're around when we fire. Da, you need to go. Go and prepare the people. For what? End game. Civilization has entered its end game. And we're all scared spitless to do what has to be done. And they will find a way. A tech fix? They're going to sell us a new improved machine? Tech won't save us. That's magical thinking, Da. Aluminum? Saturated? Genetically modified food is not what I prefer to eat. Da, go. You can prepare the people. For what? Another way of living? What do the people need to be prepared? Clean air, food, and water. We need it or we die. It's become that simple. We must face a terrible political truth, my fellow Americans. Those in power won't act with the urgency required to protect life and the environment. Things have only gotten worse and faster the more we plead or sue or protest to stop them. The environmental movement is worthless. We can't even slow down the destruction. We must resist. Resist the so-called right of whites to do whatever they want. If people loved the land, they'd stop destroying it. Ninety-five percent of Americans live in cities and towns. People don't feel or appreciate what nature is. How can they love it? Teach the people to love again. It's not the people. All the people could go fully sustainable, but the industries that pollute will still cause collapse. The problem is our leaders. Our leaders are hell-bent on totally trashing this world to make more money. The people are oblivious. Total denial. The people only see what they're allowed to see. I bet on the few. The few will always do what needs to be done. Lady, he was talking to the few. 
You talking to them right now. So you become terrorists? Rebels. We exercise our constitutional right. When, whenever a government becomes unresponsive to our life-threatening concerns or destructive to our health or welfare, we have the right written into the Constitution of the United States to abolish that government and start a new one. That is the law we stand on, right here, as Americans. You can respond more creatively. That is a terrible failure of imagination. He gestures at the missile. Dad, if foreign invaders were to do to our land base what our own culture does, do their damnedest to turn our land into a junkyard and kill or incarcerate those who don't collaborate, we'd each and every one fight back. Those with any courage. How far do you expect this rebellion to go? If we launch at dawn, probably to the death. Preferably theirs. The coyote calls closer to the camp. Nothing gets done until people are prepared to kill each other over it. Bring them the facts. The people and our leaders have had the facts about collapse for decades, decades. We need clean food, clean air, and clean water. It has become that simple. Chemtrails are the symptoms of a much, much bigger crisis. You want to change something, treat the real root cause of the disease. It is the white man's disease. We're Tico, a psychosis. Just 100 years ago, you could drink pure water from any stream. Now this culture has put carcinogens into every stream. In the blink of an historical eye, so-called civilization has put carcinogens into every piece of food we eat, water we drink, dioxin into the breast of every woman, and now chemtrails into every bit of air we breathe. The whites hate everything. They sit in silence. Da? Yes? What should we treat instead of a jet spraying poison on us? All you writers, you must have written a hundred books so you don't have a terrible failure of imagination. What root cause do we treat to give us clean food, air, and water? I'll listen to you, Daw. What is the real root cause of collapse? Just point us in the right direction, will ya? We got one missile. Let's make it count. Fade out. Fade in. Hilltop campsite. Few stars are seen. From the blackness outside of camp, two coyotes howl back and forth. Ma is checking the horse's tethers. Using a stick, Da plays with the flames of the campfire. The ranger, Sun, then Ma also sit around the fire, along with the walkie-talkie through which the militia lookouts speak to the family around the campfire. Beside them stands the white missile. The firelight and human shadows play over its long, smooth body. There's never been an authentic religion that didn't possess a highly developed system of secret teachings and also a body of wisdom concerning man's existence beyond his brief sojourn here. All ancient wisdom says we are spiritual beings. We've forgotten we are eternal spirits temporarily abiding in human form. As a result, we are spiritually malnourished, sick from a poor spiritual diet. Religion must teach how to see the spirits in all life. What spirits are we talking about? Da holds up his hand. Directing intention instead of letting your attention be captured is the primary concern of all authentic traditions of spiritual training. The first step is to direct our attention to control bodily postures. Yoga, for example. And there are many, many ancient techniques for acquiring this knowledge. Yoga is really the psychological training of the Hindu religion. Religion without this type of training is spiritually worthless. The enemy is thinking. The obstacle is thinking. Yoga controls the ideas of the mind. The goal is empty-mindedness, pure consciousness. Only by freeing yourself from the senses and thinking function, both servants of the spirit, not masters, 
by withdrawing attention from things seen in order to nourish yourself with things unseen, can this awakening be accomplished? When you've achieved empty-mindedness, your spirit emerges into your awareness, your true self, what you really are, an eternal blessed being enters your mind. You achieve what Buddhists call vipassana, clarity of vision. A true human's most important task is to make this self-awareness continuous and controllable. Without this wakefulness, one has no more freedom to form intentions and act on them than a machine. If you remain asleep, you become programmed. When you are awake, you program yourself. The greatest of all the arts is self-awareness. Then this body provides all we need. With a hand, Da digs into the soft sand beside him. He takes out a shiny red apple from the sand. This. He reaches his other hand into the air. He waits. His eyes are closed. Then he brings his hand above the fire. Everything we need. From his hand, water pours into the fire. This. Ma reaches and gently touches Da's hand, holding the apple. But not this. She strokes his hand. You turned your back on us. She touches the apple. For this? Da looks at Ma with surprise, then something like confusion. This magic could be misused? This is not magic. It is evolution. And no, no, never misused. There is a safeguard. Only when striving for earthly power is abandoned and has been replaced by a passion for the spirit will these powers be added unto you. This vision of the unseen is always accompanied by an immediate, infinite love for yourself and all life. You feel yourself as one with all life. A genuine religious experience will transform you forever. This transformation this is what brings authentic power, the power of self-love. This has been the missing part of our culture. Only when you truly love yourself can you love others. This has been the great missing link of Christianity and the Western world. You can't command people to love one another if they don't first learn to love themselves. Self-love is a power that must, with great effort, be won from self-love all love grows. Mm, these are ancient ways. Da nods. The lack of self-love is the root cause of our collective spiritual illness. As a consequence, the inability to identify with all others, all life, as yourself, as part of you, is the root cause of our culture's end game. Da, the real root cause of all this destruction lies far back in human history. Long ago, the power of self-love was methodically denied us by an inhuman thing. Or was it just a very, very bad idea? She separates sticks from a pile. About 4,000 years ago, also in a desert like this, but in the Middle East, there arose a new idea for a better way to live. It was decided that all humans are sinners, guilty wicked. All humans are fallen and in need of salvation. She breaks dry sticks into pieces, making a new pile. The strange idea of man's original sin became the foundation of a way of life, a way of life that has wiped out most of the ancient traditions you speak of, Da, traditions that felt the sacred in every tree, stone, stream, and in every human being. At one time, the earth was filled with many spirits. Where have they gone? Some have fled this world. Many hide. I don't know where. For thousands of generations, humans had followed the true wisdom of how to live on the earth, how to walk in the balance with all life. That way of true wisdom was soon to be annihilated by this new idea. She breaks more sticks. Or did an alien power possess a small tribe? So this tribe began to worship a jealous god? 
Worship a single male god living somewhere far away? Vengeful? Violent? Totally unpredictable? No, that is wrong. The one predictable thing, he would continually order his people to war, to kill, conquer, enslave. Then a Messiah arose from this tribe. He preached love, forgiveness, and peace. He was crucified. She throws pieces of wood from the pile one by one into the fire. I love Jesus's and other avatars' teachings. I have seen their words work wonders in people's lives. But the real history of the Christian church and civilization is another matter altogether. The apostles of Jesus took up and twisted the Messiah's words. They turned it into an even more severe form of monotheism. The twelve remaining apostles of the Christ created a church with the goal of converting the entire world to self-hatred, by force if necessary, and that force came to be seen as quite necessary. It was all for our salvation, of course. True Christians love one another. My point is that there are a few true Christians. There are more than a billion of us. A church marched down through the centuries to conquer and convert all humans, convert or be killed. All the millions slaughtered, supposedly, in the name of salvation. The bottom line of the point she is making is that civilized religion leads people away from their intimate connection to the divinity of the land and toward the abstract principle of the church. I got ears. One. They is burning, lady. Red, this isn't a debate. Let Ma speak, will ya? Ma tries to smile, but it has a weary bitterness which has led us into this time of bloodiness that surpasses all others in history. She can't blame this on Christians. For century after century, endless wars of Christian conquest, crusades, inquisition, the murders of heathens, heretics, wise women called witches, wholesale death and devastation has been the only lasting legacy of this church of love. What an awful chronicle its real history has been. An apocalyptic faith that teaches us suffering is the price of grace. The weirdest thing of all, most of humanity will spend eternity in hell. Heretic, heathen, true believer, it doesn't matter. Most of us are damned no matter how much we suffer. Very few will go to heaven. Rapture is for a few. So few. What use is such a faith if most are damned no matter what we do? She breaks more sticks. From the first book in the Bible, Genesis, we have been commanded, condemned to subdue nature. What has the command to subdue nature brought us but our only home's destruction? The apocalypse? Save the few by destroying our world? This so-called religion is the real root cause of our culture's endgame, but it is a very, very bad idea, or is it actually an alien being, a species of life mistakenly we call our God? She stops snapping and burning sticks. A snake has quietly wound its way towards the fire. It curls in the sand amid the circles of humans. It is a rattlesnake, very poisonous. The ranger is about to draw her knife. No. Da motions with his head. There, on the perimeter of the firelight, two small pairs of eyes shine in the dark. Then, two coyotes come forward and sit in the firelight. They, too, are here to hear you, Ma. I have spoken. You have spoken well. You have told of Watiko, the white man's psychosis. Ma, come. Sit here. Give our deadly guests some room. Ma goes round the fire, away from the rattlesnake. She sits between her son and the ranger. A bird walks into the firelight. It settles onto the soft sand near the rattler. Road runner. Snake killer. A single red laser dot pulses on the snake's head. Spirits. Red. Let it be. For now. The red laser light vanishes from the rattlesnake's head. 
About a hundred years ago, a story began to be told that God was dead. Perhaps that was true. Institutional Western religion, so the story goes, had lost the faith of the collective. The religious canon that had guided our civilization for centuries had invisibly collapsed. But man has to believe in something higher than himself. That's his nature. Culture needed a new story, some myth that had meaning and gave meaning to men. Since one god had fallen naturally, another arose. He sits up. He moves closer to the fire. Humans tell stories to live, and we live by the stories we tell around fires, lighting hundreds of thousands of nights' stories, pass to each new generation the most essential truths and wisdom of how best to live stories. What replaced the story of monotheism for Western culture? It all began with a scientist named Galileo. After him, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes, along with many Western thinkers and scientists, all determined the universe in our world, even our bodies, ran like a clockwork machine. He, too, breaks a stick into many pieces. Bacon promised scientific knowledge is the one power from which all good flows. Hobbes promised that only a scientifically organized society would protect men from each other's brutality. Only a rational civilization would give us progress in a better, safer existence. Descartes promised men would become masters and possessors of nature if only they followed the rational scientific method. Descartes said, Cogito ergo sum. <laughs> I think, therefore I am. Thinking became civilized man's most important activity. The scientific method came to be used not for answering the great questions of life, why we're here, where we're going, how best to get there, no. The scientific method was only concerned with manipulating, manipulating facts and tiny dead fragments of the earth. That's where we went wrong. That's when we kicked into high gear our culture's love affair with the end game. We would progress but a world would have to be destroyed in the process. He throws pieces of wood one by one into the campfire. The followers of Galileo, Descartes, Newton, and Hobbes not only falsified or obliterated the basic spiritual facts of human existence, but cut short any chance for Western man's spiritual evolution. This became known as the myth of the machine. Hobbes said without civilization, man's life was nasty, brutish, and short. Hobbes' one-sided story of, of life as a constant struggle for power became the foundation of the homicidal doctrine of Western imperialism and the ecocidal myth of the machine. These Western thinkers and their followers eliminated every value and purpose for Western culture except one. The pursuit of scientific truth. The sun nods. They place scientific truth above any obligation to morality. For this lack of moral concern, we all live in the shadow of destruction. The entire world has been poisoned by the misguided application of scientific knowledge. This was an emotional reaction against 1,200 years of the church's domination. Revolt against the church's divine authority. Or revolt against an alien god. Now the sun breaks a branch into pieces. Living above all else means dealing with problems. The scientific method deals only with problems that are distinct, precise, and quantifiable. Therefore, it relies on mathematics, logic, objectivity. If we abandon all sentiments and irrationalities, all problems can be solved. This is the way, the only way, we are told to solve problems. This is the road, the only road of progress. He throws pieces of wood one by one into the fire. There are basically two types of problems. There are convergent problems, for example, how to make a better machine. The more different people who logically study and break down the pieces of a machine problem, the more converging results we acquire through the scientific method. Convergent problems are what the scientific method excels in solving. That's been very well proven. It's all about how to make machines better and more powerful. The other type of problems that plague our culture are divergent problems. The perfect example of a divergent problem is how to educate our young. Some reasonably argue that discipline is needed to educate our young. Another group, which is also reasonable and logical, states that freedom is required to bring a child to its full potential. Two lines of logic diverge and lead to opposite conclusions. Logic and reason are helpless to solve a divergent problem. It's a conflict of values. Yes. A problem of values will not yield to one agreeable solution using reason. Logic does not converge to one single solution we all or most of us can agree on. The problems afflicting our culture 
and what you brought the end game are divergent problems. Some of our culture's critical divergent problems are progress versus quality of life, the rights of man versus the rights of nature, growth versus sustainability. These critical divergent problems do not yield to logic. The scientific method can't help us reason our way out of the end game. We can't think our way out of collapse. The problem of collapse has to be solved using a higher order of thinking. Call it super rational. Unfortunately, our leaders are all scientific rationalists. Our national debates are all logical. Therefore, they offer no viable solutions to our real problems, spiritual values. Mankind closed the gates of heaven on itself. Other forces are afoot, Da, than mankind. The myth of the machine is the root cause of jets trying to spray away a problem of values. He looks into the sky. We used to see so many stars at night, remember? Everyone looks up. They're still there. Now, there are no alternative storytellers who are allowed access to the mainstream mass media. They need that media system to tell the people how to change their suicidal ways. We've been locked out of the collective storytelling around the fire. Only priests of the machine speak to our children in the dark night we've entered. The story they tell, always the same, spoken like a magical mantra. Technology will save you. A machine will save you. Deus ex machina. God from a machine. The humans and animals sit in the silence by the fire, darkness all around. Then a turtle crawls up beside the ranger. It settles on the sand. The ranger cuts the red apple and offers some pieces to the turtle. The offering is ignored. All our relations would hear from you also, daughter. I have fought in war. I've also made a study of the history of war. I examined the most unique phenomena perpetuated by the human species organized warfare. One interesting document that I came across was titled The Report from Iron Mountain. It was written by a think tank in the 1960s. It had to do with the problems of living at peace. When our president at the time read the report from Iron Mountain, he ordered every copy burned. The ranger takes out a whetstone. She sharpens her knife on it. When President Eisenhower gave his last speech in office, he was leaving in, oh, 1961, he warned America of the gravest threat to our freedom. He said the gravest threat to America's freedom was the military-industrial complex. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, stated that capitalism could not exist without war. I didn't understand what Marx meant for a very long time. When everyone wants peace, how can war be inevitable? She spits on the whetstone, then she rubs in the saliva with her finger. I remember battle. I had never seen such selfless bravery. The courage I witnessed was sacred. I saw soldiers holy with courage. And I began to realize what Marx meant about capitalism and war. She continues, stropping the blade on the whetstone. Competition is the sustaining and motivating force of our capitalist system. We're forever competing with each other, striving to outdo, to surpass, to win against all others in a selfish battle for our own personal gain. But endless competition deprives men and women of what I think is our most important instinctual need, the instinctual need to cooperate, to give selflessly, to put others before you for the greater good. She checks the sharpness of the knife's blade by slicing a leaf. Because of a system long in place and still organizing our society today, the only outlet for the complete satisfaction of such a sacred instinct is war. What system? The war system. The war system organizes all modern societies. All political and social forms of organization are subordinate to the war system. Ever since the first nomad became a farmer and claimed land as his personal property, he's needed someone to protect it. That goes back almost 8,000 years. 
There are other broader, more profoundly felt functions of war. The report from Iron Mountain said, once it's realized that war making potential is the principal structuring force of any modern society, then its non-military functions become clear. It's these invisible functions that maintain war readiness as the dominant force structuring modern society. What non-military functions? The political, for example. War is virtually synonymous with nationhood. The elimination of war implies the inevitable elimination of national sovereignty in the traditional nation-state. Without war readiness, no government has ever been able to obtain obedience from its people or maintain its right to rule. She sticks the knife's blade into the coals of the fire. The report stated, The historical record shows one instance after another where the failure of a ruling regime to maintain the credibility of a war threat led to its own downfall. What are the other functions of the war system? The ranger takes the blade out of the fire. She cools it by sticking it in the sand. There's the sociological function. Fear of war is the individual's psychological reason for allegiance to a society and its values. Allegiance requires a cause. A cause requires an enemy. The presumed power of the enemy must be sufficient to warrant an individual's sense of allegiance to their society. The critical point is that the enemy that defines the cause must appear genuinely deadly. She withdraws the knife from the sand and wipes off the blade. The menace must appear at least to affect the entire society. She sips from her canteen. Then there is the scientific function. The report said that the relationship of war and scientific research and discovery is more explicit than other non-military functions of the war system. War is the principal motivational force for the development of science at every level. She thumbs the knife's blade. War is also a generational stabilizer. By killing younger, possibly destructive generations that threaten the authority of their elders, war is an ideological clarifier. It gives ultimate meaning to existence. The business of war becomes the basis for international understanding. War profits a military-industrial complex, and war makes the complex grow. The complex makes war grow. Ah, it is the ultimate vicious cycle. This vicious cycle permeates history. The report from Iron Mountain's conclusion was that peace would bring chaos. It found no substitutes for the war system without them being a terrible threat to the stability and survival of America. She slides the knife back into its sheath. No wonder the president ordered all the copies burned. Now two antelopes come into the firelight. They sit with their legs folded under them. Since 9-11, America has been in effect on a permanent war footing. Martial law has, in legal terms, been declared but not yet implemented. This has been done, I conclude, to prepare us for what is to come. What is to come? Soon there will be almost 10 billion people competing for the scarce resources of this planet. It will not be peaceful. She stares into the fire. Nothing can bind us together, make us obey our leaders, and do our duty like the fear of war. All movements toward peace are doomed unless somehow, some way, we replace the war system. The real root cause of our environmental collapse started 8,000 years ago when land became personal property. Man could treat it any way he wanted, mistreat it, abuse it, poison it, even kill it. None of the animals around the fire seem afraid of each other. Not even the snake is afraid of the roadrunner. The humans, too, are calm in the presence of their wild guests. They sit in the silence. What nonviolent action could possibly save us? Is there one? What peaceful solution could save us from the end game? The spirits would like to hear from all our human friends. The ranger slowly looks around. The animals all sit calmly, watching. How peacefully to save our land. Animal and human spirits, all together now, await your words. Speak of a peaceful way to save us all. 
In the mountains, far in the distance, lightning strikes, thunder rolls. End of Act One. Act Two, Fade In. Night, hilltop campsite, in the midst of impenetrable darkness. The animals and humans quietly sit around the campfire. All look at Da when he speaks. All periods of profound change occur in a time of great crisis. Then, it's human nature to collectively seek a great task. Only a great task can unite people with one will. The old dreams have been dreamt out. The dreams of technological progress, endless prosperity, the thoughtless mistreatment of the earth, these old dreams are done. Only a great noble task can unite us to peacefully change for the better. We have always tried to protect our children from clear and present dangers. We have passed laws to protect them from alcohol, tobacco, and many risky activities until they were mature enough to make these choices for themselves. The list of laws protecting our young is long. I would pass a law to defend our children from what I believe might be the most destructive piece of technology ever invented, introduced into almost every home in America without vote, public debate, without our informed consent, without any scientific examination of its effects. It is a machine which. In fact, has been a terrible experiment on all our children born since the 1950s. He takes out a tobacco pipe. He starts to clean the pipe with his pocket knife. Promoted as a cheerful friend, a great teacher, a miracle of technology that would connect us all as one. However, it has been scientifically proven beyond any reasonable doubt this machine devastates our young's healthy brain development. It causes cognitive impairment and learning disabilities in growing children continually exposed to it. It also numbs our children to violence. It makes our culture's incredible violence appear as a natural way of life. It is addictive. It creates addictive personalities. This machine has been discovered to methodically influence children with very specific beliefs, values, and behaviors. The television. The sun nods. For decades, TV has been scientifically proven to impair the brain's natural abilities. Primarily, and most significantly, it severely impairs the brain's ability to create inner imagery. Inner visualization is critical to a child's ability to think abstractly and to imagine. But growing up with the explicit imagery of TV, nothing is left to the imagination, so it doesn't develop as it should. Based on the dramatic continual drop in aptitude test scores since the 1950s, it's a fact that our children have grown less intelligent. Scholastically, our children now lag far behind any other industrialized nation. What is so important about imagination? 
I believe a healthy imagination is the most powerful tool for the survival of our species. Imagination also creates the most important human resource absolutely necessary to get us through this long, dark night. Imagination creates hope. A powerful imagination creates the compelling vision of a better tomorrow. Hope is the motivation to create a better tomorrow and to live for it. The son taps out scrapings from the pipe. He takes out tobacco. He loads it into the pipe. I believe, collectively, our culture has no vision for a better tomorrow. As a society, we can't imagine anything different. It's a hopeless culture without a clear vision of a better tomorrow. So depressed and emotionally ill it has become, I think, as a whole, terribly self-destructive. Just like a person. People love TV. Why else would they watch it so much? By the time the average American child is five years old, she's seen 15,000 murders and countless acts of violence. By the time she's only five years old, she's had 150,000 commercial advertisements shot directly into her brain. He tries to light his pipe. The wind keeps blowing out his matches. Because TV mostly communicates in images, the images that a child sees cannot be resisted or removed. How can that be? The human mind hasn't evolved to know the difference between an artificial image and a real one. On the subconscious level, the images are believed. He lights his pipe with a stick from the fire. For anyone watching TV, no matter what program they watch, their brain waves fall into a state similar to those found in people in a trance or under hypnosis. In effect, when we watch TV, we go to sleep. The images just go into the mind and do their work. For an innocent child, resistance is futile, and the damage lasts a lifetime. He slowly puffs on the tobacco. All the scientific facts about the destructive effects of television on a child's growing brain have been proven beyond any scientific doubt for decades. Yet such an idea to eliminate TV from the life of children under a certain age, say 21 years, until the brains have fully grown, has never been seriously considered, let alone publicly discussed. Why? TV is totally necessary for their power and control. Television is our culture's most powerful tool for creating very specific beliefs, values, and behaviors. Most unfortunately, TV is totally controlled by possibly the most ruthless beings that have ever walked the earth. Without a TV in every living room, these weird psychotic beings would be wounded, maybe fatally. They would become vulnerable for the destruction they so well deserve. Ban TV. Ban it from their lives. Mm -hmm. Our children would become the imaginative, hopeful creatures they are born to be, taught to be humans by real human beings, not by cartoon characters, paid celebrities, or beautiful, deceiving stars. They could be educated and nourished to their full potential, not programmed to be a cog in a machine. He is not angry. He is sad. That's the great peaceful task I would perform. If you had the power. If the alternative storytellers used the Internet, they could be heard all over the world. If enough alternative stories fill the Internet, they could turn it off. Then there is another Internet that would turn on. More thunder and lightning in the distant mountains. But the lightning seems so straight and vertical. They watch. Then the phenomenon vanishes. Silence once again. Da, what say you? Da is taking out a string of wooden beads. He passes the beads one by one between his thumb and index finger. The pursuit of happiness. I don't know for everyone what happiness could be. But as a doctor, I believe happiness is based on one thing. It is not everything, but without this one thing, nothing else much matters. The foundation of happiness is health, wellness. Our nation is sick and getting sicker. Our health care system is not just broken. I think, you know, my experience tells me it is keeping us sick. America spends twice as much on health care than any industrialized nation. But we have the most incurable diseases of all. Because no doctors can get to the root causes. They can, but won't. They're all diseases of modern civilization, like the one I have. Da lowers his head. Is he upset with his son or with himself? Soon, one in every five dollars an American earns will be spent on health care. That cost will continue to rise if American medicine continues to be practiced as it is today. Soon, the Obama health care insurance will become law. We'll have to buy it. Those who are seriously ill but can't pay their premiums will lose coverage. 
inability to pay medical bills is the number one cause of personal bankruptcy in America. In the past few years, the cost of health insurance for Americans has doubled. At the same time, health insurers' profits increased fourfold. The chance an American who already has health insurance will be bankrupted by medical bills is 7 in 10. Wait a second. Even if you have health insurance, there's a 70% chance medical bills will bankrupt you? Da nods. In the congressional debate over health care reform, no one was allowed to publicly debate a universal, not-for-profit health care system. Even though two-thirds of Americans and most doctors want one. Obama health care is going to impose a broken system and make us buy its defective product. Corporations should never be allowed near a health care system. Any honest debate about health care must acknowledge that our for-profit health care system is the problem and must be junked. Our bodies are now fat, weak, and sickly. A system which profits when you are sick is illogical. It's immoral from the standpoint of achieving wellness. A corporation that profits from our sickness will only work to make us constantly sick to ensure its own survival. Its cures ensure more diseases. My experience tells me this. By law, corporations must make all decisions based on the most profit for their business. So, keeping you sick is logical. Nothing personal. Just business. But socialized medicine will not be the answer we think it is. No, no, not at all. A single-payer, not-for-profit, universal health care system is not the true solution. If I could do one peaceful thing to change this country for the better... I would change the way we practice medicine, not a system where a cure only treats symptoms. No. Go back to the old ways. Train healers to prevent disease. Treat root causes. Pay doctors for keeping us well. There are ancient systems of medicine that are totally ignored by the American Medical Association and disallowed by insurance companies from coverage. Why? They compete. They heal. Da nods. What types of medicine? These alternative healing systems use touch, hypnosis, crystals, sound, gems, light, flower essences. They're categorized under vibrational medicines. There are also complete ancient systems like the Ayurvedic and Chinese homeopathic and osteopathic models that are cheap, effective, and non-invasive. The perfect example of Western medicine is the invention of the birth control pill. Why? Indigenous people for thousands of years have used local herbs found everywhere for birth control. Soon, I am told, to expect that two in three Americans will die of cancer or complications from it. Yet I know of cancer cures that are simple, cheap, and non-invasive, but they're against the law. By the power, that is the one nonviolent task I would perform. Change the way we practice medicine. Today, the American medical system is not just a shame. The government is to promote and protect our health and welfare. When a government becomes destructive to those ends, it is our legal right to abolish it and start a new one. An owl silently swoops into the campsite. It perches on a rock. There is no commotion or fear. Powerful spirits are now in this sacred place. The truth of words we hear. Now, my brave daughter, speak of a great peaceful task to unite and change us for the better as a people. President Eisenhower warned us. He was an army general and a two-time president of the U.S. He saw the greatest threat to our freedom. The greatest threat is the military-industrial complex. I've come to believe him. The ranger takes out the clip of ammunition from her sidearm. She slowly unloads the bullets from it. I have seen in the last century how this government sends our troops into foreign countries on the pretext of saving a democracy or bringing democracy or protecting democracy in America. 
Our Congress, which legally has the only war powers, sits on its hands during the so-called police actions, wars. For the last hundred years, I have also noted that when businessmen come into government administration and then they wield power, often war or a police action begins. It's especially pronounced behavior among wealthy businessmen who enter politics. I think that under the cover of patriotism, they use soldiers to profit their personal business interests. The two Bush presidents and their fixation on oil. Mm -hmm. They came to power with the clique of Texas oil men. So they fabricated a reason. Lied. Under each Bush president to go to war against oil rich Iraq. The ranger examines the bullets one by one. Then she reloads the clip. There's a two-time winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor, a Marine general named Butler. He was one of the most decorated soldiers in history. After he retired, General Butler said that he fought all over the world for one thing, big business. I agree. Captain, may I clean my rifle as I speak? Yes. Just move slowly, soldier. Slowly. The ranger brings her assault rifle into her lap. She unloads the ammunition clip and sets it aside. She takes out her cleaning equipment and cleans the weapon as she speaks. Today, America's forever war against terrorism has allowed our military-industrial complex to reach the entire world. A forever war? The war against terrorism has no foreseeable end and no sure victory. We've been told that over and over. We're fighting wars against terrorism that are defined under international law as wars of aggression. More than 50% of America's discretionary federal budget now goes to defense spending. Our military budget is greater than the rest of the world's combined. The warning we forgot? Beware the military-industrial complex. She breaks down her assault rifle. Almost 70% of the people working for the Pentagon are private contractors. They work for profit. Why should they want war to end? Corporations have taken over our internal security and intelligence. Why should they ever want to stop spying on us? Corporations run our economy. Why should they want things to change? Corporations own our communication system. Why should they want to share it? Corporations own our two political parties because the Supreme Court said corporate money was freedom of speech. What do you mean money is freedom of speech? Only for a corporation, not for natural human beings. Is that logical? No, but it's legal. According to a recent decision by our Supreme Court, corporations can give unlimited financial donations called campaign contributions to politicians that is called, in the court's decision, an exercise of a corporation's right to free speech. Payoff, buy-off, corruption. At one time, it was just called bribery. They loot our treasury at will. How? Well, why do you think, in good times or bad, since the 1980s, we never balanced the federal budget? Year after year, our national debt rises? For two centuries, we balance the federal budget except in times of war or severe depression. What happened? The forever war evolved. And we're now the world's largest debtor nation by far. How will we ever pay it all back? In 2008, 2009, the U.S. Treasury loaned our money, backed by the full faith and credit of our government, to big international banks, $16 trillion in bailout money. We live in a socialist state already, except the real welfare recipients are huge corporations. What's happened to our country, as I understand it, is called inverted totalitarianism. It's corporate socialism. She looks down the barrel of her assault rifle that has been stripped out of the rest of the weapon. In normal totalitarian nation states, the state would take over the corporations and industries. The state would nationalize them. The ranger nods. Well, in America, the totalitarianism has become inverted. The corporations have taken over our government. She reams out the rifle's barrel using a rod with a small wire bristle on its end. Every branch of it, every department, every regulatory agency. In political science, that's what's called regulatory capture. Corporations have captured the governmental agencies that are supposed to regulate them. Now agencies like the EPA or the FDA facilitate a corporation's business. They don't regulate it. But we're terribly afraid to admit that a government we believe in, fought for, killed for, is not good for the majority of the people. 
It benefits only the few. Our government now works for what has captured it. She expertly reassembles the assault rifle. In the last 100 years, a corporation by law has been given all our human constitutional rights and protections. But it is not human. It cannot be killed. It does not work for the people. Huge corporations now employ a tiny fraction of Americans. And if they pay taxes at all, they have a lower effective tax rate than the average working class citizen. Now, really, they control everything. Food, energy, medicine, money, the government. A corporation has no country. It has no conscience. It has no home to protect, no family. What does it care for? Money. Survival at any cost. Total domination of the global economy. The first thing you do in war is identify the enemy. Big corporations have become the enemy of the people and of the earth. But based on the unshakable belief of, is that husband what you call magical thinking? Whereas before her eyes avoided his, now her eyes find his eyes. Yes. Based on the magical thinking that what is good for business will be good eventually for everybody, we help them go about their very destructive business. She sets her rifle aside without loading it with ammunition. Ma, your weapon needs cleaning. Captain? Yes. Ma takes out her revolver and hands it to her daughter-in-law. The ranger unloads it, breaks it down, and cleans it. Corporations are not mentioned in our Constitution. That word, incredibly, does not even appear in the Constitution. If I had the power, peacefully, by the law, I would get corporations out of politics. No more lobbying or bribing elected officials. No more corporate socialism, no more subsidies or tax breaks. I would take back from them all the rights of a human citizen. I would take away the powers that they've legally accumulated, but which have allowed them to illegitimately undermine our democracy. I would make them return to what they were, servants, not masters. The great, peaceful task, Grandfather, if I had the power would be to pass a constitutional amendment to strip corporations of natural personhood and all the rights, powers, and protections granted to a human citizen. No corporation, organization, association, or other group of individuals shall be granted, nor shall ever be granted the protection our rights afforded natural persons by this Constitution. Yes. That sounds good. She hands the revolver back to Ma. Then she hands Ma the bullets. You may need these. Soon. Now, the thunder and lightning, with these straight vertical flashes, has moved from the mountains onto the desert floor. i never seen lightning like that. The atmospheric phenomenon stops. Silence. Ma slowly inspects the bullets, then loads them into her revolver. A story used to be told to every American child. It's about the time when young George Washington cut down a cherry tree with an axe. The founding father of our country was asked by his own father, Who cut down my cherry tree? George said, I cannot tell a lie, father. I cut down the cherry tree. I cannot tell a lie, father. Once upon a time, we believed in the need to tell the truth. We depended on truth. Speaking the truth was necessary for us to live and work together. Somehow, we have come to live lies, tell lies to each other, and tell lies to ourselves all the time. We do not know one ultimate supreme truth. Everything is relative. Ma smiles. In the order of outrageousness, the lies our culture tells us that human beings are separate from and superior to the rest of natural creation, that the earth and all her creatures were created to serve human needs, that an act is right if it creates the greatest wealth for the greatest number of people. That a corporation's highest responsibility is to its stockholders. That we can have it all, endlessly mining the land and the sea, and never pay the price. 
that technology will solve every problem, even those created by technology. And the biggest, most dangerous lie of all, that the Earth is endlessly resilient and resourceful. How to prove a truth that enough people will believe? Well, with the help of a voice recorder that plays backwards. I mean, it won't save us, but it can help enormously. There is a truly novel and profoundly important discovery about human speech that many scientists and doctors believe should win the Nobel Prize. It works so well that governments, corporations, intelligence services, and law enforcement use it. How does it work? Strange to say, a child learns to speak backwards first. How? It just does. Then the child learns to speak forwards. As we grow up, we consciously learn to speak forwards. Unconsciously, we also learn to speak backwards. Strange as it may seem, embedded in the words we speak forwards are words that also speak backwards. It is called reverse speech. About 35 years ago, the man who developed reverse speech analysis was a therapist who started investigating the lyrics of songs. He found that the lyrics of songs have embedded reverse speech, just as so many had contended years ago. Then he studied politicians. He found that our leaders speak backwards. Why would corporations or law enforcement use it? Well, because reverse speech reveals what you really think and feel. In negotiations or in military and criminal interrogations, the subject reveals their truth coming from an unconscious level. That truth is spoken backwards. Your truth is always revealed in reverse speech? Well, the reverse speech comes from the unconscious part of our minds. It can't be consciously altered or falsified. I discovered that all politicians, business leaders, and media personalities I recorded then analyzed their reverse speech. They all lied. All the time. There was only one person I found who spoke the truth forwards and backwards. Who? You, Da. How would you use this reverse speech? Well, if I had the power, the one peaceful thing I would do is have the fourth branch of our government. Oh, fourth branch? There are three. What's the, the fourth branch? There are three, the executive, Congress, and the judicial. There's a fourth. It's called the grand jury. Citizens of every county in the United States are empowered by law to convene a grand jury. A grand jury of citizens can investigate, subpoena, and indict any wrongdoers it discovers. No one is above the reach of a citizen's grand jury. I would equip citizen grand juries with the trained reverse speech analysts to interview, then study, the recorded interrogations of our politicians in office and those seeking office. It would become a periodic rite of passage for our elected and aspiring leaders. When the voice recording of the interview, it has to be spontaneous and, ins and unscripted to produce the most reverse speech. When the recording is analyzed, the politicians' real thoughts and feelings will be revealed. The people can can be informed. Simple questions will work, such as, have you ever made money illegally, accepted a bribe? Voted based on your own self-interest? Why do you want the power of office? Lies our leaders tell us will be revealed in their own reverse speech. We could elect those who spoke the truth forwards and backwards. We could reject those who lie. They sit in silence. Only Da spoke the truth? forwards and backwards. If I had the power, not only would the liars be exposed, speakers of truth would have to serve. If you were a speaker of truth, you would have to serve in some capacity best suited to your abilities. Can you imagine having speakers of truth working through our government? What they could tell us. To survive the end game, we need to be told the truth. None of us have the power for these tasks. We have the power if we take it back, if people resist peacefully. But how peacefully can we take back our power, Da? 
How can we resist, yet keep the peace? End of Act Two Final Act The storm is closer. Now it is a distinct dark mass. The straight shafts of lightning strike the earth beneath it. Strange. Then it goes quiet again. The wild animals grow restless. The tethered horses snort. Da speaks quietly at first, staring at the spirits around the fire. Great tasks have always required great leaders. We lament the lack of great leaders today. Ma stands and then sits beside Da. She touches his hand. He takes her hand and holds it. Our response to our situation must include a renewed reverence for the commonwealth. This sanctity of the commonwealth our leaders reject. The wealth we all hold in common has the least respect and protection of all. What we all hold in common is the earth. Da nods and smiles. Our activists for change are a great multitude. Many groups that are separate, autonomous, and working alone. From a military standpoint, that has an advantage. You can't decapitate one single leadership. But the dysfunction is that they have no overall objectives. They can't focus. They can't even agree as one. We can't act as one. We have no unifying philosophy. Our task is to build a movement that can act as a counterweight to corporate America. We must articulate and stand behind a viable and uncompromising socialism, a socialism that is firmly and completely on the side of the working class and the rights of Mother Earth. We must give up the delusion we can influence the power elite from the inside. If we remain passive as we undergo this largest destruction of our land base in history, not just our society, our world will perish. Human history always begins anew with an act of disobedience. Disobedience is a first step towards freedom. Towards hope. Towards power. Towards meaning. He stares into the fire. Resistance will take place outside the arena of electoral politics. The more we expand local credit unions, community health clinics, local food cooperatives, and build local alternative energy systems, the more empowered we will become. He nods at the fire. The democratic system that once made reform possible is dead. Why? It is dead to the will of the people. We must resist and as one. Resistance means a radical break with the formal structures of American society. We must cut as many ties with consumer society as possible. The grotesque fact that a great dark force has seized control of collective life must be shouted with alarm over and over in the main square of every town and on every street corner in every city throughout the land. He puts Ma's hand to his cheek. Above all, what I see for our salvation will be for mankind to undergo something like a spiritual conversion. He digs Ma's hand into the sand. He lifts it out. She holds a white rose. We need great leaders, Da. They hear a jet, far off. They look away toward the dawn. A single jet is spraying. It comes towards them. The strange, dark storm is gone. We will either defy the corporate elite, which will mean peaceful, civil disobedience and a rejection of traditional politics for a new radicalism, or see ourselves consumed. Time is not on our side. The longer we wait, the more assured our destruction becomes. Our moral obligation is not to the structures of power, but to life. We are now in control. That is the strength of a civil resistance. With the same soft voice, each new generation used to ask the elders. It was always the same. How are we to live? Da, if you were our leader, what one great task would give the people back some power we have lost? Da watches the chemtrail jet pass overhead. Bring down a big corporation. Destroy one, just one. 
How? They live on money. Stop buying what they sell. They will die. They sit silently. Facts alone can't persuade people. Only a new story can persuade people to junk the myth of the machine. We have at our disposal, unless they turn it off, the Internet. And if they turn it off, another one will turn on. We can use the same tools we've been undermined by. Our activists for social change have forgotten that a story is as important as a fact. A well-told story is much more persuasive than facts alone. We are programmed that way by our evolution. We believe well-told stories. We can't help the way we feel about stories. It's an instinct. They know that. So, the corp so corporate entertainment and government propaganda are designed to sway emotions. Rarely do they use facts to sell their position, so we must tell stories. The son takes some pills from his bottle. The corporations employing the science of public relations and the technology of TV have used actors, artists, writers, and filmmakers to manipulate public opinion. He swallows the pills. The artists shroud the incredible violence of our society in justifying myths that lend moral authority and legitimacy to the violence. These stories keep people from seeing the violence for what it truly is. Manifest destiny and the destruction of the Indian nations. Civilization and the destruction of the environment. War as noble, glorious, and inevitable. Always a story. Only a story can move the people. He kneels. If art aims to affect our feelings, we call it entertainment. If art aims to affect our will, we call it propaganda. They don't give us power. They exert power over us. Something is missing from our culture's art. Truth. The power of truth. Great artists strove to communicate the power of truth by appealing to man's higher faculties, which are spiritual. If art is to have any real value, if it is to make the best part of us grow, it is to spiritual understanding we must make our appeal. The art we must send to the entire world must be an education in spirit, an education in the power and wisdom of spirit. True art is the intermediary between man's ordinary nature and his greatest potentials. True art can transform us, evolve us, empower us with the spirit we truly are. What is the first story that should be told? As a people, we are in the clutches of evil. There is a way out. But only if everybody resists. You must resist. If you don't, all will be lost through your own fault. The humans are smiling. The animals have bright eyes. Our culture functions by separating us from each other through competition. Separating us from our food supply. From our energy sources. Separating us from our ancient traditions and wisdom. Ma nods. The first light from the rising sun enters the campsite. We have also been separated from our inner lives. We can empower ourselves by facing ourselves in the deepest, darkest parts of our minds. We need something that everyone can do day in and day out. It requires no machines, no money, no expertise or training. It requires only a desire to live by what I call a, a new ethic, a new ethic that gives daily attention to what is within us, struggling in the dark inside of us. She looks at all around the fire, one by one. We have been split apart in our minds. I believe the fate of the world is in our psychic wholeness. One of the most important consequences of this new ethic is that the integration of your personality, its wholeness, becomes a supreme personal goal upon which the fate of the world depends. How does one do it? By directing your attention from the conscious to the unconscious. What is ignored within us is now running rampant over the world. It is destructive, deadly, out of control. No outward tinkering with the world will address the real problem which is in our minds. No new tech, new laws, or constitutional amendment can bring peace to the spirits, to the gods and the devils and the human soul. Unless these repressed and ignored forces of nature occupying the inner world of our human unconsciousness are faced and known by consciousness, nothing will stop them from tearing down again and again what our conscious thinking has built up in the outer world. 
Many people don't understand. We need to know our nightly dreams. We must remember, record, and try to understand our dreams. In the dramas of our nightly dreams, our eternal truths about ourselves, we must recognize and respect. Every ancient culture and modern depth psychology recognizes the royal road to the unconscious is in our nightly dreams. Even if we do not logically understand our dreams, we must face them. The magic which occurs in remembering, recording, respecting this language older than words can heal us. It is the disease of modern civilization that spirits driven out of this world around us have fallen into our unconscious minds within us. They are fighting inside of us. Yes, Ma. And when these gods fight, the world will perish. Can it be so simple? Yes, yes. The highest truth is always the most simple. We must attend to the dreams of our inner life as carefully as those of the outer world. The daily ritual of dream analysis can strangely, magically, miraculously heal us. The gods and demons in our minds need to be known and loved. Knowing and loving our dreams will save us. All sit in the perfect pregnant silence of the sunrise. The fire has burnt down. The campsite is vivid in the rays of the risen sun. After identifying the real enemy, learn its strategy and tactics. Learn the strategy of a system that cuts us off from the land. One hundred years ago, most people lived on the land as self-sufficient farmers. Now we've been herded into cities and towns. Because land brings power, with land comes food, shelter, self-reliance. She stands up. We need our land back before they wipe out the last wild stocks of food, fish, and game. They took the land. We could not be proud and free without the land. Da looks up. Many jets now lay chemtrails in the dawn sky. After your symbolic act, what happens then? I don't know what happens then. This I know. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls the children of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the earth, he does to himself. Doc, can most people afford your treatment for the chemtrails? No. Da, the aluminum in the chemtrails, uh, will it poison the air, soil, and water? Yes. As he tried to rally the last Indian tribes to fight back as one, the great chief Tecumseh said the three calamities are folly, inactivity, cowardice. As the sun quickly rises, we see all the wild animals have left the campsite. Da puts his arm around Ma's shoulder. She smiles at him, then lowers her head. She smells the white rose she holds. The ranger douses the fire. She takes a black charred stick from the ashes. With the stick, she draws charcoal lines on her cheeks. The sun stands up beside her. I will help you. She draws dark lines on the cheeks of his pale face. She puts her hands on his chest. She smiles. Why? It makes us both strong. She hugs him. And brave. She looks around, then at the sky. What say you, great chief of the Apache? Hmm, nothing lives long. Nothing lives long, except the earth and sky. Except the earth and the sky. Something to the east of the hilltop alerts Da. Then it surprises him. What? Da looks at the chemtrails all over the sky. Then he looks down to the horizon. The rising sun fills his face with radiant light. What? It is coming. Fast. Why? Our words tonight have wounded it. Our words? On the hilltop, all the humans look into the rising sun straining to see what is coming. What?
I told you. We pull back and circle the hilltop. Other forces are afoot than mankind. The sunrise is glorious. Something approaching throws a tremendous shadow over the desert, moving swiftly towards the hilltop. Still rising and circling so far from the hilltop, all we can see is the white, sunlit missile pointing towards the sky. My son, this is the enemy of all the earth. We have wounded it with our words. Fade out. End of part one. Thank you.